Welcome to chapter six, object modeling. Now, through the first five chapters, we learned how to go about defining the needs, the requirements, the processes, getting information from users, putting that all into documentation to decide what a system needs to do, how it's gonna do it, where it needs to do it, when it needs to deliver the information, the whole nine yards. Well, now we get into the actual construction and we're gonna talk about a common modeling method used, which is object modeling. And the reason we like mod object modeling is because it parallels object-based programming. So when we create documentation here that lists an object, lists its attributes, lists its methods, that'll all make sense in a minute, we're giving a programmer the information already in an object-based model that they understand. So let's take a look here. So first of all, the objectives. If you want to go ahead and pause and read these, you can. But we're going to get through these objectives in the next two lecture videos, this one and part two. So go ahead and pause on these objectives. And then let's get started. So object-oriented analysis is, as it says, describes an information system by identifying things called objects that represent real people, places, events, transactions. So anything that is an object that has attributes to it, that has methods. So when we talk about attributes and methods, it'll make more sense here in just a few minutes. So the object-oriented methodology is popular because, again, it integrates with object-oriented programming languages. So Java, Smalltalk, VB.NET, the whole .NET, Python, Perl, you name it. So programmers also like object-oriented code because it's modular, reusable, and easy to maintain. As we'll see, we're going to instantiate an object or create an object that can be instantiated hundreds of millions of times within a program, thus doing the same thing for each record, say, for example, in a database. So terms and concepts, well, we're going to look at UML, UML, the Unified Modeling Language. So the method of visualizing and documenting an information system. That's what it's all about, right? As, as we present this information, we gather information from end users, from management on what the system needs to do, and then we document and we go back to them with these graphical representations of the system saying, is this what you said? Is this what the system needs to do? And then they're able to say yes, or they're able to say no, and we're able to modify the documentation accordingly. So as we look at creating these objects, we're gonna look at attributes, and those are characteristics that describe the object. Okay, we can think of those as adjectives. So we have a noun such as parent, you know, and adjectives that describe the noun are attributes in the case of an object. Methods, those are verbs, okay, tasks or functions that the object performs. A message is a command to perform a method. Notice the difference. So we're going to call that method and say, execute that method when we have the information needed or, you know, or go pull this information from a data store, process it, and put it back. A class is a group of similar objects. So as we talk about a class, we might talk, you know, class human being. And then from there, you can just imagine how far we can go down or, or you know, class mammal, for example, and then start describing mammals, subclasses of mammals, sub subclasses of mammal. You get the idea. And an instance is a specific member of a class. So an instance would be when we instantiate this object, we're doing it based on one unique, say, person in the mammal class. <laughs> so here's a good example of an object. So represented with a rectangle, okay? Uh, the object name at the top, followed by objects, attributes, and methods. Now, we'll define this more in a minute, okay? Because this gets fletched out. But you can see we have this object called driver. Attributes of the driver object, maybe their driver's license. Uh, number, their age, maybe their experience driving. Do they have insurance or not? Hopefully they do or else they shouldn't be driving. You get the idea. So that's an object. Well, then uh, can send messages, okay? Messages or this can be a method in the object, okay? 
where the driver turns on the windshield wipers and in the car object, okay, would be a method called windshield wipers. So the driver object would send a message to the car object saying turn on windshield wipers and that would be a method of the car. Turn on brake lights would be a method of the car. So when you, you know, when driver sends the message by stepping on the brake, the car knows what to do, you know, initiate the brakes, check for skidding, you know, uh, distribute now, distribute brakes to which wheels aren't skidding, those kind of things, um, turn on the brake lights. So these can be pretty, if you think about all of the objects, sub-objects are involved in car object. You can see that this is greatly detailed. So here is how we would document a represented object. We have this, um, this design here and up above is the name of the object. Then we list the attributes. I'm going to get you to do this both on the homework and in the lab this week. Attributes, name, age, sex, hair color, methods for parent object, read bedtime story, drive and carpool. Boy, we could certainly, any parents out there could certainly fill this up pretty quickly. And then instances of the object would be a specific parent, in this case, Mary Smith. Mary Smith's age, 25, female, red. Now, one thing that I want you to think about, we've talked about a data dictionary, okay, already, and we've talked about, you know, each element of data. Well, this really wouldn't make sense in a database to have name Mary Smith, right? So better attributes here would be first name and last name, right? So we normalize the data. So each attribute should be a single piece of data. So if we were doing address, we would want street number and then street name. So that should make sense. That way we can do a query or reports on street names or you know, that kind of information without having to say, oh, well, first pull the number off of the attribute, then query or sort. So we wouldn't want to do that. So just think about, we'll talk more about normalization, but just start thinking about, you know, normalizing those things. So next example is a child object. So a child, if you notice, inherits some of the attributes from, you know, from what might be a person uh, object and a person object could lead to a child object called child, okay, or a parent over here. So uh, again, name, age, sex, you see a lot of these things, number of siblings, that would be unique to a child, and then the unique methods of a child. So consequently, back to our example, the parent object could send a message to the child object to pick up toys. That might give you an example of that. So we go down a little bit more, you know, here's a dog object, um, you know, attributes, name, breed, age, color, etc. So you see how we could easily create a, you know, mammal object that has name and age and, you know, some common things in it if we wanted to. So, so attributes, characteristics that describe, again, uh, think of these as an adjective. So if you notice here, we have a student object and an instructor object, and we see that some things are the same. You know, student number, instructor number, those would be different, but name, both objects are going to have that attribute. Both objects should have an address, a telephone number. Uh, both objects may have a date of birth if we choose to store that for the instructor. Okay, so you get the idea of how common attributes can create a class above um, so that we don't end up with a bunch of redundancy in code. So fitness class schedule object. So here is an object fitness class schedule. You know, we have a fitness class number. That's going to be our primary key, most likely. That's going to be the unique identifier for each uh, instance of fitness class schedule. Date, time, type, location, instructor number, um, you know, maximum enrollment, methods, delete, change date, change time, change instructor, change location. Uh, you start seeing some common verbs being used here in methods. So registration record object, you know, this would again be a single 
uh, member who registered into a class, right? So in this case, we'd have a class object associated with many or one class associated, this will make more sense in a little bit, to many registration records, to many students that registered for the class. So methods, as we talked about, these are verbs. Okay, so a specific task that an object can perform. So method to, you know, a method called more fries. So that's the method name, more fries. That includes multiple steps, heat, oil, fill, fry, basket, da, 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 da. For some reason, every time I read this, I just want to go ding, fries are done, ding, fries are done, ding, fries are done. Ah, some of you may get that reference anyway. <laughs> kind of a fun little thing from the past. Another method, add student. So how do we add a student? Well, it takes, in this case, nine steps. Add a student uh, instance. So we're instantiating the student object. To add an instance of the student object, record the student number, record the student name, record. So this information is most likely coming from a student object that's already been instantiated and as we add student you know we're adding them to that object we're instantiating the object so we're creating the new one then we record the information that is unique to that instance of the object a specific student for example so messages it's a command that tells an object to perform a certain method so the same method uh, message to two different objects can produce different results so this is the idea of, as it says here, polymorphism, where depending on the input we give it, the program knows to take that input and do different things with different inputs. But the idea behind that is that we only have to write the code one time, and depending on the variables that are given, the code knows what to do based on the variables it's given or the command or the messages that it's given. Okay. So we don't have to have that same message five times between, you know, five objects, for example. So you can view a, a, a complete object as a black box. So the message can trigger a change in the object without specifying how the changes must be carried out. So we just know something needs to happen. It's the programmer and the information we give the programmer that will define how that's going to happen. So selecting gas at a gas pump. You don't know how it works, you just know you select the gas, right? So encapsulation, all data and methods are self-contained. So we like objects that are encapsulated objects because the information is self-contained, as it says. We know what that object contains, we know how we're going to use it, um, and it stands by itself, which means if we know that object works well, someone can come in behind and utilize that object, say a calculator object, for example. Why would we want to sit there and write one when we could go out to, say, the .NET library or you know the Python library and get a calculator that just meets our needs and instantiate that object into our program? And then as we need to do calculations, we instantiate the object with the inputs that we need to calculate, and off it goes. So an example of a message here. So good night. Um, polymorphically, okay, that's going to mean something, and we're going to act on it differently depending on the object that is receiving the good night. So in the case of if a parent receives the object, the message good night, it causes the parent object to read a bedtime story. The dog causes the dog object to go to sleep, one would hope, and the child object uh, to get ready for bed. Okay, now part of that get ready for bed may be waiting for parent to read bedtime story. So you can see we have the single message, and as we send that message to different objects, they act differently. That's the polymorphic portion of this, but we only have the one object. So, And then under the each, each uh, message, sorry, we only have the one message, and then under each object is a method that says, well, if you receive this message, do something different. So classes, an object belongs to a group or category called a class. I almost wish they would have put this slide at the beginning. I probably should have moved it. 
all objects within a class share common attributes and methods. So kind of talked about this, right? So, you know, moving on, subclasses, objects within a class. So truck object represents a subclass within a vehicle class. So we can have a vehicle class, you know, that might list make, model, year, might even list number of tires because every vehicle has a certain number of tires. But notice here, it's talking car, minivan, truck, school bus. Is a vehicle, you know, do, how do we define that object? <laughs> Maybe object vehicle is something with wheels that provides transportation. So a subclass might even be a bike, for example, okay? Now, a superclass, a general class, a novel class belongs to a superclass called book, okay? Because all novels are books. So here's that idea that a superclass might be, um, you know, a superclass might be vehicle, okay? And then subclasses of vehicle would be, you know, of, of the vehicle class, or it could be uh, a superclass transportation subclass vehicle and then subclasses of the subclass vehicle car minivan truck uh, moped you name it so here's an example here where they're putting what we just learned in into application graphically so we have this class called vehicle subclasses car minivan truck you know school bus notice that each is going to have a uh, make model year weight color to truck, we might add an additional attribute called load limit, attributes for school buses, emergency exit, you know, so uncommon attributes, additional attributes that wouldn't be found in the common class. Common methods, start, stop, park, all of these start, stop, park, so you get the idea. Uh, employee, so here we have this class called employee. An employee can be a manager, office staff, or instructor. So class name, common attributes, common methods. So we might store employee and then have additional. Now, when I do this, I like to think, how would I put this in a database? That seems to help me create that object. So, you know, I'm going to have this table called employee, common attributes there, and then I might have a sub table for manager with their attributes and methods, sub table for office staff, you get the idea. So analysis, a uh, little bit more. So super class, remember I, I said human, they're going to say person. You know, what, the, what are common attributes for a person? Again, first name, last name, all people should have a first name and last name, we would hope. They definitely have a date of birth. If this is a U.S.-based program, social security number. All people in the U.S. should have a social security number. You know, methods, breathe, eat, sleep, you name it. Then we go, you know, so super class leads to class employee, could lead to class student, could lead to whatever. And then, you know, down below the subclass instructor, so we might here at the college, we have an instructor subclass. We might have administrative staff. We might have managers. We might have support staff that are all subclasses of class employees. So you get the idea of how that might work. So relationships enable objects to communicate and interact as they perform business functions and transactions required by the system. So describe what objects need to know about each other how objects respond to changes in their in other objects. So again, that may be some polymorphic programming going on there. Effects of membership in classes, superclasses, and subclasses. So another great thing about these objects is it suddenly makes it easy if we secure at the object level within our application, we provide some security. Uh, you know, managers are going to be able to see certain employees, for example, but employees aren't going to be able to view other employee records, for example. So strongest relationship is called inheritance. So it enables an object called a child to derive one or more of its attributes from an object called a parent. So we saw that in the previous, right? We had, you know, a person object and, you know, then an employee object and the employee object inherited attributes from the person object. So that's how we would program. So here's a, here's an example. We have this, you know, a parent object called employee and instructor. We're going to use that. Um, 
So the parent object is employee, the child object is instructor, and the child object would inherit the common attributes of employee into the instructor record. So you get that idea. By doing this, we're not having a bunch of redundancy of data. It can go get the data it needs from the table called employee, for example. So sometimes it can be a little bit difficult for people to understand the hierarchy of these classes. So we use an object relationship diagram. So if you notice here, I think this one's just a little confusing. I almost wish that they would have stopped right here here to say, you know, a manager is an employee, office staff is an employee, instructor is an employee, okay? A manager determines the fitness schedule, okay, lists open fitness classes. Office staff can do a registration record, so they administer those registration records. Instructors are going to indicate their availability into the registration record. Instructor teaches a fitness class, the registration record would generate or add a student who takes the class. So by doing this, you start seeing the relationship of the different objects in the program. How are they going to interact? And, and the cool thing is, as we do this, we start seeing messages okay, that need to be passed to other objects to instantiate some sort of method in this object that will add a student to the registration record. So registration record adds a student. So it needs to somehow know to do that. So I think we're going to stop right there. We'll come back. We'll look at UML and case modeling in the next lecture. All right, that's enough for now. Take care.